Hello everyone, welcome back to this channel. My name is James. Welcome to the last chapter of A-level computer science called Declarative Programming. And we're gonna look into Prolog, and that's the icon of Prologs. And these are the topics that we will be learning. So now, without further ado, let's dive into what Declarative Programming Language means. It's, it is a paradigm where the desired outcome or result is specified rather than the steps needed to achieve it. So in Python, all we have been writing about are the steps. But in declarative programming language, you will need to write down the problems that you want to solve, the logical statements, like SQL, regular expression, logic programming, functional programming. And how these programming languages work is beyond the scope of this syllabus. But um, hopefully Prolog can give you a sense of how declarative programming work. Now, to understand Prolog, you need to understand what's the constructs. What are their constructs? We have facts, rules, and queries. And in Prologs, you need something called the knowledge base. And within each base, you can set write as many clauses as possible. And each clause will contain facts and rules, sometimes without the rules, but at least some facts. And then you can solve a problem by running a query. And I believe that when we are discussing about this, it's a bit vague. So this is why in this video, I'll also be showing you some prolog code and how we run the query in the terminal. So by the way, go back to how we define a clause. You usually need a head and also a body and a full stop is required. If you don't have this, prolog is gonna give you a syntax error. And also you need to know what are the data types in prolog. Data type is called a term and a term can be an atom. It represents a constant consisting of a sequence of alphanumeric characters starting with lowercase letter. It can also be number, also by a variable, an identifier that starts with a capital letter. And also compound term, a predicated consisting of an atom and a number of argument in parentheses. And throughout this video, you will see these terms appearing everywhere. Now let's look into our first example and we'll write down a few clauses in Prolog. And in this case, I have a few terms that I need you to know when writing a clause. So first of all, is the predicate. In this case, color is the predicate. And RED, when R RED is a number, it signifies how many num arguments are within this predicate. And this entire line here is called an atom. And when we combine those predicate and the argument we have a compound term. So this is what we call knowledge base and within each knowledge base there are multiple clauses. So I already created the file .pl file for prolog and this is the predicate and this is the argument. And you might be wondering how can we use this um, in prolog? So we can run a query to ask if red is indeed a color. So by the way, knowledge base means we set our own rules. And when we do this, we're saying, oh, red is inside a color. So we can run a query to ask if red is a color and the prolog an will answer true. So let me try to run this code for you to see. So on my um, terminal here, I first need to consult the file name. I mean, I need to first consult the file, which I named it as color, um, color sun colors with the S. So after I run it, uh, now I'm inside my, I'm accessing my knowledge base. So I can run the code color red, remember a full stop. And it will just give me a value true because this color is in my knowledge base. But if I were to run color apple, then when I do this, it will give me a result false because apple is not defined as a color for my code. But of course you can, we will see a lot more examples. So I'm, at this point, if you are still feeling confused, that's okay. Just give me more time to show you more examples. And next up, another thing about prolog is term variable. Assuming that now we have this knowledge base and it's, I just create a predicate like, and this predicate stands for John likes pizza. John like pasta, John like salad, 
similarly goes to Anna, Mary, and another John, and it, what it owns. So, knowledge base, and we can run the following query to find out what John likes by using a variable. So, do know that this is known as variable because all the variables need to be capitalized. So when Prolog see a capitalized word, it immediately know that Prolog, um, food is a variable. So in this case, you can see that John like three item in our knowledge base. So when you run the query, this is what Prolog will give you. If there's more option, you need to put a semicolon. So now let me run this code again. This is my knowledge base I've created in the .pl file. And let me consult the file by, oops. Okay, now let me go up. So instead of, we need to write down the names. So I believe it's called liked. Yeah, called likes. And then I can run the query likes. What does John likes? Um, maybe he's, I name it as favorite. So it's, it's a variable, I can name it anything I like. I do favorite equal to pizza. If there's one more thing that John like, I can do a semicolon to ask Prolog to give me what's another f favorite of John, salad, etc. So um, let's do another example. Instead of John, let's do Anna. And instead of favorite, oops, it has to be sh sh smaller case. And instead of favorite, let's do food. It doesn't matter, right? And pasta, sushi, and ice cream. And what Prolog is basically doing is to just go through each of the lines here and find pattern where the first argument is Anna and then prints out its second argument because I put the variable name in the second argument. And that's how Prolog works. This is why knowledge base is essential. And yeah, that's how we do it. I can also run the query owner owns and owner and put it in the second argument and they will show me who actually owns a house here, which is Mary and John. And I believe we can run it here. Just put owns, let's see what we have. Um, instead of a house, maybe we'll check who owned the car. So we have a car owner variable and the car in the second argument. And that do, car owner, only Mary has a car. And which is true, only Mary has a car. And that's how we use variable in Prolog that's amazing. So now, what does the term include? And there are times when you can use anonymous variable. So this is when you use, um, I changed the file a little bit, basically shows where they own the object, London, London. So the third argument is the location. And then with a variable, I can print out what's Mary own a house in London. But if let's say I don't care about the location, I can just put an underscore to signify that this is an anonymous variable and Prolog will just print out who owns the house instead, instead of printing out the location. All right, so that's now how it works. Now we have learned how clause can be used in constructing a knowledge base and run query to test whether facts is true or false. Now let's look into rules. Now look, um, we have this another knowledge base here that basically state who is whose parents. So that's the parent name, that's the children name. And we can write something like this, a rule. And this rule can state the two person X and Y will be sibling if the parent die, they have the same parent. So X, Y, Z, at Z, Y here, considering X is not equal to Y. So I put this dot um, colon dash stand for if, just to make you um, understand better, and comma stand for n. Now, if I were to run this query, you will see, you will be able to check whether siblings, Tom and Lisa are siblings based on this knowledge facts. So again, I have the sibling file here, and you can, um, let's check whether Tom and Lisa are siblings. So let, first of all, we always need to consult our um, file to access our knowledge base. And then we'll check whether siblings, um, Tom and Lisa, whether they are siblings. And oops, yeah, correct, uh, yes. 
<laughs> wow, they detect typo for me as well. Good. And then I will check whether Emily and Tom, they are siblings. So Tom and Emily. But according to the facts, they will give us the programming language will determine that, hey, they are not siblings based on this because they have different parents. Now, that's how rules work in a prolog. Use this if symbol and use a comma if you have two um, rules, sorry, you have two propositions to write. And instantiation and backtracking. So in prolog, instantiation binds variable to values, while backtracking enables the exploration of alternative solution by undoing previous choices. So now we have seen how prolog helps to identify whether they are siblings. And there's a feature in prolog called trace. And you can find out how prolog arrive at the solution. So let me try to run it for you to see trace dot. And we can just write trace dot to enter the trace mode. And I will run the same query, sibling, Tom, Emily. And instead of giving a straightforward answer, Prolog will give me lines that trace how he actually it actually finds out the solution. Enter, enter until it gives me the false solution. You might not you don't need to understand every single line here, but I do provide a guide here. Core indicates that the initiation of a predicate, the process that it goes through, and crypt shows step by step execution. Exceed marks successful completion, and redo we attempt fail denotes a predicate failure. So which is something that we already have here, but that's just a functionality I want to introduce to you when using prologs. So uh, we can also do recursion in prolog because it involves rules. Remember recursion, you always have a base case and a general case. You can define the rules using codes like that. So base case factorial zero will be equal to one and factor n result, this is the general case. And we have if here, if n greater than zero, n1 is n minus one, factorial n1 sub result, result is n times sub result. So there is some syntax involved here, but I just wanna show you an example of how I can do this. And you can run, run the query and it will just give you the result. Works just like how we use recursion in Python. But then if you can see here, we are stating the facts in our programming language. And instead of going through step by step, we are just stating the facts and let the computer use the fact to find out the answer. So it involves more logic here. So again, let's test out the code. I have my factorial code over here. And let's um, go into no trace mode, oops. Yeah, um, groups, I have some arrow here. So, well, how do I do this? Well, anyway, let's go back to our code. But if you were to run this query, you will get 120. So, and if you want to trace that, you can do so like that. Next up, let's proceed to list and prologs. A list is an, an, or, is an order collection of elements enclosed within square bracket capable of storing objects of different types, including atoms, numbers, variable. So you can put a numbers or a string, and a list is comprised of a head and tail, where the head represent the first element and the tail represent the rest of the list. So I, in this case, I won't run the code again because it's pretty um, straightforward, only one line. So you can write this separate head of tail, and this indicate that it is a list. You can put a list here, and if you assign head here and tail here, head will be equal to one, tail will be two, three, and four. And that's how prolog works. Head is always the first item in the list. So uh, similarly, you can also run this clause and do a mindless query. Bra square bracket H and L represent head and last. And it this is what it will give you. And um, you can also do a list in a, pr in a prolog. It's empty. Will it, this will be true if list equal to empty list. So if you use this, code here as a knowledge base. And when you run the query is empty, you put an empty list into it, it will be true. 
if you put something into the list, it will give you false instead. Again, you are giving a fact in your knowledge base and Prolog will run the query to check whether something is indeed empty. In fact, you just named this yourself. Now, there are two functions in list processing predicate. So the first one is uh, the append function. If you were to type in this line of code into your terminal, you will get, okay, first one, two, three, four, and you name this variable as merge list. Merge list will be equal to one, two, three, four. And if let's say you have the first item and you keep the second item as a variable and the third item as the resulting list, second list will be equivalent to three to four. So that's how Prolog implies what it should be here for you. And that's a pen. As for the member predicate from Prolog, it checks if an element is a member of a list. So the first item is the member and the second item is the list. We'll check whether this number is inside this list, which will give you false. And also do member and put a number here as a variable, and they will let you know that number, it can be either one or two or three or four. And that's list processing predicate for a prolog. It's either append or member. Now, the write predicate in prolog is used to output terms to the standard output stream. And this is what um, you how you print something in Prolog. It's quite um, not so straightforward as in Python, but that's just the syntax. Write variable if x equal to ten. Write blah blah, blah write ten, and that's how you print something uh, a difficult way. And you can also do um, write a clause called read and write that can ask user for a term, and once you enter the term, and this code will just write whatever you have just written. Do remember that uh, when I'm preparing this slide, I made a mistake. I used um, an uppercase letter and I used spaces and that's not accepted in Prolog. So the input must start with a lowercase letter and not have spaces or be enclosed in quotes. So you can write a user-friendly program using the read and write predicates. So this is um, some codes that I've written and that's some rules. And if you were to write this code, magic eight ball dot, and it would say, welcome to magic eight ball, ask your question, a level computer science, that's what I want to type in. And the magic eight ball would say, maybe who knows. So if you look at how it answer, it actually follow this pattern here. First of all, it write down the welcoming message. Read question stand for um, what it wants, the input from me, it's asking an input from me. And it will do random answer using the answer I gave. So in this case, um, I have some code in which the user, so the program will just randomly pick one of these answers here and answer me. So that's how an example program of how you can create a user-friendly program using Prolog. But of course, if you want to create a program like this, Python is still a better choice. And um, Prolog is more on the logic side of things. But that's the end of this video. It is also the end of this video series. As you can see, it's already late at night. Um, thank you so much for watching. Let me know what types of video you want to see, um, watch next. And I'm probably be taking a break. So hopefully this series has helped you so far. Let me know what's your feedback. And I shall see you in the next video. Goodbye.